right. Good day, everyone. Good to have you here. Welcome to the Tatro Show. Pretty excited about our guest today, bringing him in all the way in from, I think, his home. I think he's working from home today. I'll bring Martin Roberge in right away. Bienvenue. Welcome, Martin. So welcome to the show, Martin. Pretty excited today. Catching you maybe on holidays? No, you don't take holidays, do you? No. Well, I do, but in August only. Okay. Okay. Uh, you are in Montreal, correct? Well, South Shore. I'm in Kandiac, which is about 20, 20 minutes from Montreal. Okay. For those of you that don't know, I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com, portfolio manager here at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management and the Tatro Wealth Advisor Group. Uh, I've introduced him, but I'll bring him again more formally. Uh, I'd like to introduce right now Martin Roberge. He's Managing Director, North American Portfolio Strategist here at Canaccord Genuity. He's got a CFA. He's been doing this for a while. He's been right on a lot of calls in the past since I've uh, gotten to know Martin. Incredibly smart guy. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the red button to subscribe. Subscribe to our video. Subscribe to our channel. So tell us, first of all, first of all, Martin, what are twin deficits? Twin, it's the sum of the, the trade trade deficits, like the, the, the uh, export imports we do with uh, the U.S. does with other countries. Okay? So trade deficit, and how much we export, how much you import, the net, if it's a deficit, that means you're that's, importing that's more than you're That's the trade deficit. And then you have the budget deficit, the federal, uh, as you know, the federal government, like in Canada, uh, the liberals are spending like crazy to get the economy going. Well... Uh, Trump is doing the same thing in, in the U.S. Like the Republicans are are spending as if there was no tomorrow to make sure that the the re, there is a recovery, obviously ahead of the elections, uh, preferably. But the price to pay, because we haven't solved the uh, the trade deficit with China, and this is one of our big trading partner. Well, I'm talking about the U.S. big trading partner. The fact that we're not solving this this trade dispute. And the fact that we keep on generating higher and higher budget deficits makes me believe that we're going to run like into a, a situation where the twin deficit, which is the sum of the budget and of the, tra of the trade, the sum of the two gives you the twin deficits, will reach about 18 to 20 percent of GDP by the end of 2023. And as you can see in 2018, I think on the chart, you can see that we hit almost like 10%. And this is when the uh, the U.S. debt was downgraded from AAA to AA. So it makes no doubt that um, the U.S. debt uh, has been downgraded by the S&P to AA in 2011. But I think that the other uh, rating agencies like uh, Finch, uh, will also downgrade uh, U.S. Uh, AAAs uh, to uh, to double A's, and that will put pressure on on the uh, on the U.S. dollar as well. So this is this is what I'm, I'm I want to see. I want to I want to see the market um, discounting this um, this um, ballooning twin deficit before uh, turning uh, negative again on the Canadian dollar, because I believe that by default. Um, things are going to get worse in the U.S. relative, like in Canada, it's going to. We know it's going to get bad. We're, we're going to reach almost 300 billion this year, okay? Um, uh, but as a percentage of dif uh, of the GDP, it's less than in the U.S. So in relative terms, it's worse in the U.S. So I expect to see eventually the market, you know, dumping some of the U.S. bonds maybe uh, because they feel that there could be a currency risk exposure. And, uh, and this is all going to play out probably over the ne next 18 months. So uh, we're not going to have to wait that long. And, uh, and once we, uh, we, we start accelerating to the downside, I believe that uh, it's, going, it's going to be quick. Uh, it's going to be quick. And, and that will coin, coincide with the final re-rating in the Canadian dollar. You you and I have talked about uh, twin deficits in Canada in the past. I remember right. uh, you, you had mentioned it. I think one of the first guys to mention it in one of our either was an event or you mentioned it and, and you had mentioned at the time that it's tough for the Canadian dollar to appreciate relative to the U.S. with the, the strong level of twin deficits that we had yeah. in Canada. And basically you're yeah. taking the same theory, the same twin deficit theory and you're applying it to the u.s and you're saying yeah. it's going to be worse in the u.s than in canada yeah. the yes that's why there is some upside left 
it's a, it's it's like a, a contest of the dirtiest uh, t-shirt i don't know how you guys say it but uh, you know it's a, it's a, it's like a, this is a like who, whoever is going to uh, get the worst deficit first or the, the biggest deficit first and as as much as i know that in canada it's going to get it's going to get bad it's going bad in the gradual way in the us it's going bad at an acceler accelerating pace okay Hence, this leg down in the U.S. dollar that will keep the Canadian dollar afloat. But for the same reason you said, historically, when Canada runs twin deficits, it cannot go much higher than its fair value. And the fair value, which is the, the Big Mac index, like the price of a Big Mac in, in the U.K. should be equal to the price of a Big Mac in, in Winnipeg. Okay, so... So this Big Mac index, which which is called the purchasing purchasing power parity, gives a fair value around 77 cents for the Canadian dollar. So that's why I I have a like a a target of, of 75 with upside risks to 77 cents. I loved it. I remember distinctly first learning about this Big Mac test when I was taking my courses, my MBA course at the University of Manitoba with Professor John McCallum. And he was teaching us, you take a Canadian dollar, you convert it to US dollars, you cross the border, you go to the, the Big Mac in, in Fargo. And you know, how much is your Big Mac going to cost? And you're saying uh, the relative value should be 77 cents. And in a twin deficit, you shouldn't see it creep up much higher than 77. I remember you saying 80 ish, 80, 82 ish was kind of the max. Back, this, back this is this is if oil this is if oil gets probably above 60 and gets outside Canada in order to look at the Canadian dollar above 80 cents it's probably 60 on WTI and oil going out of the country uh, right which which we don't have now up, we've got some uh, uh, pipeline issues uh, yeah. for about three, for another two years, I believe. Yeah, it's going to take, which is why we, you know, generally we've, we've been somewhat bearish on the Canadian dollar here at this price or close to this price. Um, yeah. So you heard it here from Martin Robert, the U.S. budget has a dirtier shirt than the Canadian yeah. because their twin their twin deficit is slightly worse than ours. Uh, I'm going to go here to slide nine, Martin. Yeah. Uh, so this is about the, the bonds and the, what we're cutting, uh, here, I'll let you describe this slide, but you're talking about the yields here, um, going from 0.75, just the change on the yields. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just that, uh, like the yields have been coming down, uh, and a lot of folks are, uh, are saying that we should not rule out the possibility that 10 year treasuries in the U S, uh, drop below zero like in Europe, for example. This is a 30-year 30, 30 chart. Those of you that are wondering here, this starts in 1990 and goes all the way to, to currently. So it's a 30-year chart, uh, the yeah. trend that we see here. And what we, saw, it's, it, what we show, it's a little bit uh, of a technical chart because it shows the deviation from the four-year average. Historically, the, four, the, the bond yields will oscillate around the four-year average or the 200-week moving average up and down. But normally you don't deviate like more than 200 beeps or 2% below this, this four, four year average. And the four year average is at 2.2% right now. So if you subtract 2% from 2.2, you get to 0 0.2. And you can see historically like 200 beeps or 2% two, two, two is, is the maximum downside you, you will normally see the bond yields when you go into a recession. So we cannot rule out a trip to 0% or 0.25 beeps, but it's very unlikely that we will stay uh, in a sustained way below two, uh, below 0%. Yields are more likely to rebound. And again, understanding that the four-year four average acts, acts um uh, like as a magnet, well, the magnet is 2.2. So it's 75, you've got maybe 75 beeps to the upside, but you've got 120, like almost 150 to the upside. So the return to risk ratio is not that great. And again, I, 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 I pledge your viewers that if they want, want to uh, hedge against 
rising interest rates, um, preferred shares, convertibles are, are some, some alternatives that they can, can buy uh, to, to replace the income portion of their uh, asset 60-40 mix. They, they can, like, you, you can buy preferred shares with, with resets and maybe that's a, a topic for another show, but that's one way for you to protect your portfolio from uh, a rising interest rate environment. That's a good idea. That could be a great show. Just understanding preferred shares. People are so confused with preferred shares. It is a tough, it's a tough concept to get. They get the volatility of equities and yet the yields of, of you know, good bonds or, or global bonds. And you're wondering why have they dropped so much? Why are these press and, you know, the issue with the perpetuals and the fixed rate resets and the resets and the variable yeah. resets. And it's maybe a show for another day, but I will say yeah. this, my viewers, and anyone who's followed me on YouTube uh, knows that I've been preaching alternatives as a replacement to fixed income for the yeah. for the income portion for a long time because you can't you can't get half a percent in fixed income anymore. What, what do you do with that? You can't retire off that. But Rob, please tell you like for anyone listening to show to the show, please don't go 70-30 on your asset mix because you cannot find alternatives for the 40%, don't do that. You will no. increase your expected return, but you, you will increase also your risk. Yeah, so we. I'm, not... I, I'm a big, big, big believer, Mate, and you know me, we, we cannot increase the risk for clients because as much as they think they might be ready for it, your risk tolerance is your risk tolerance. You're born with it, and if you can't sleep at night, if your portfolio is down 10%, then you shouldn't be 70-30. Because what we saw in February is you, you were down more than 10% over, over a one-month period. So risk tolerance is something that we don't mess with. Um, volatility and, you know, so for us, the key is to, to limit the equity exposure. If we're able to keep some alternative assets that have zero volatility or have a, a quarterly NAV or a quarterly reevaluation of the NAV, yeah. that's a good asset to have, provided yeah. it's safe, provided it's high quality, provided it's well-managed. Um, those make sense as an alternative to a combination of equity and fixed income. Yeah.